So, um, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Prakash, thank you very much. I feel a little bit like I'm in the Punjabi Triangle. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, maybe I should restart learning how to do sternotomy. Um, I'm also a friend, though, uh, of logical thinking, and uh, you know the last picture that you showed with the uh, touching the wires could kill. Um, I don't think that anybody that touches the wire call, uh, worries about the 200 euros that he has to pay in fine or the $200. So the sign is there. It may not be. It may not make sense in itself. And so let's just go through this and see where the sense may be uh, in terms of minimally invasive. Uh, mitral surgery. So I'd like to make an opening statement and not go into this, just have it, put it into your mind. So if there are two treatment options that produce equal outcomes, um, the lesser invasive one will prevail. I mean, this is one thing that I didn't come up with that, that Paul Modi has running around and many others have also said this. So that's all. If, if, if the patient has the choice, then you know what's going to happen. But it's about safety, the talk. And uh, Prakash went into this and also addressed some of the details on and, and some of specifics of terminology. And one, one word in the, in the um, title is safety. And uh, so if you look at, if you look at um, the internet, then you find a definition and the, it goes that safety is the condition of being protected from harm or other non-desirable uh, um, Outcome. So, you know, you really think that all, you know, us here um, are really um, those that are protectors from harm, or maybe are we those that cause harm, irrespective of the way that we use, okay? So, I don't know if that, that term is correct, but fortunately, I found uh, an alternative definition, and that is safety can also refer to the control of recognized hazards. And so, let's see what are the hazards in uh, mitral valve surgery. And if you go to sternotomy, you have the unstable sternum, you have surgical wound infection, you have surgical trauma, you got exposure, which may be better through sternotomy, may be better through minimally invasive. That depends maybe even on the case. You have the cosmesis aspect. So for the mini thoracotomy aspects, and uh, Prakash has addressed many of them already, you have mortality issues, stroke maybe more, maybe more iatrogenic dissections, more phrenic nerve injury. You have groin complications that nobody likes to talk about in this case, um, and then re-expansion pulmonary edema maybe. You got longer cross-clamp times that has been addressed, and you have repairability issues. Maybe it has been addressed. So let's go through. A meta-analysis in 2013, it demonstrated that you have um, a tendency towards uh, more mortality with minimally invasive techniques, and also more cardiovascular complications. Then there has been a consensus statement from ISMIX, and uh, Folkmar, uh, he always hates me for showing this because he says, oh, it's old, it's not relevant anymore. But I like to address it anyway. It states that uh, you have to, uh, they only issue a 2B recommendation to the minimally invasive approach, so there is recommendation in the guidelines for, or in the uh, experts' opinions here. But it's, um, it's, um, they say that there is an increased risk of stroke, there's supposed to be increased risk of aortic dissection, uh, phrenic nerve palsy, and groin infections. So um, that is an issue um, that is there. So, but three years later, and that's why uh, sort of Falkma doesn't like to have that uh, statement quoted, um, they published a manuscript where they uh, looked at mitral valve uh, surgery and uh, did another meta-analysis, and in that meta-analysis, they didn't find a difference in mortality or in stroke. Completely the same outcome, depending on, this, on the um, number of studies that are out there. Then we did this, and uh, Prakash has already demonstrated this, where I, together with Joe, looked at scientific and non-scientific <coughs> evidence, because the uh, scientific evidence may not be there in a way that we would expect it. And that's true. That's the way it goes. Um, so, bottom line, it also showed no mortality, no, cardio, no uh, cerebrovascular complication, no difference. So, I guess it depends, it, it doesn't make a difference of what you do. So, those two lines we can uh, strike. What about dissections? Now, this is a manuscript from Leipzig, uh, and Sergei Leonchev, that was also, I contributed uh, also to this. I had the one or other odd uh, intraortic, uh, intraoperative dissection. The problem is that I couldn't nail it to minimally invasive. And um, 
Sergey, in this report, also can't find minimally invasive as a risk factor. So he finds dissections that happen also through sternotomy. So that may be in one report a little bit tendency towards more, but it's 0.2% versus 0%, whatever. 0% is always awkward. We all know that if a type A dissection happens, it's a dangerous thing and it's terrible. But it may not be related to the approach that we use. Uh, groin access. Here we use this... Um, um, percutaneous approach for it, and you can see this here. And then I want to show you something else. That's for phrenic nerve. Um, how we deal with the phrenic nerve here. If you see, oh, no, sorry, didn't stop. No, sorry. Um, anyway, the what we do is we open the pericardium very high. And um, there you go. We open the pericardium very high and have so much, oh, I'm sorry that doesn't work, doesn't work here in the way. Uh, I can't find it. Anyway, we open it very high. Here you can see it. Here's the, um, the phrenic nerve is down here. The phrenic nerve is down here. We're all the way up high before we open the pericardium. So there's 10 centimeters or so. And many people go close to the phrenic nerve. And if you pull, if you pull traction sutures on there, um, we have the feeling that the phrenic nerve gets pulled, and that may be the reason for it. With our approach, um, phrenic nerve injury is not a problem that we have in our minimally invasive experience. And so maybe that's something that you can handle. So that's something we can also strike from the list. Groin complications, we can also strike, for, uh, we have addressed this. I showed you the percutaneous approach, and we have published this, 450 patients, and we've just started, you know, we took the ProGlide system from the cath lab, from the hybrid OR, when we did the transcatheter valves, took it into the operating room and just applied it. And um, here's the outcomes. Uh, if you look at the manuscripts closer, then you actually find a higher uh, groin complication rates if you take everything, you know, lymph fistula, uh, wound infection, and everything you can find. So we have 8%. We had 8%. We brought it down to 2% altogether. In the first 100 cases where we did selection, of course, always if we palpated correctly and only if we felt safe, we had no complication with the device. So that is really something that um, uh, uh, has helped us to reduce groin complications. We also have shorter operating times and less, uh, less hospital stay due to the using this device. So that is a, that's an issue we can, we can strike. So this is what it looks like eventually. It's like two little minor incisions. The next thing is pulmonary uh, edema, re-expansion pulmonary edema. The, there's a lot of talk about this, and it's only supposed to be associated with um, minimally invasive approaches. The interesting thing is that all the manuscripts that are published about this always have applied one lung ventilation. And um, that may be an issue if you try to cut cardiopulmonary bypass times down. Uh, but in general, if, with, if you use uh, no pulmonary, uh, no single lung ventilation, we just use, have a single tube and we take the lungs off and start the pump right away. But then um, that's why we don't have this, this problem of unilateral. And, but we do see patients with pulmonary complications after this type of operations postoperatively. But the key is, I think, that has also to do, uh, that also happens if you have a patient with stenotomy. So that's, uh, that's also not a, so that's, so let's look at clamp times. So here is uh, one of the things. Uh, this is the, the randomized trials. This is the large, large uh, uh, registry trials. The operating times that have been reported here have been between four and five hours, and clamp times has been about a good 20 minutes longer. And if you look at here, Rakesh's uh, study, that's really impressive because he has 104 minute mix cl uh, clamp times and 24 for the sternotomy. So I believe, I wonder whether the same surgeons actually did the cases. You know, there's like, it's very difficult to compare if, if, it's not, uh, if it's not the same surgeons. And uh, same with clamp times, they're also longer, obviously. So that's nothing new. But the one thing you can imagine is if you have longer clamp times and clamp time is a risk factor, why is the outcome always the same? 
So, you know, it may have to do with surgical trauma, and it may actually be that what we win through smaller incisions, less surgical trauma, we lose with longer bypass times. That's one explanation. I have no proof for that, but that's just one explanation. So just to show you our experience in Jena, I mean, I had done a lot of minimally invasive cases in Leipzig. When I took the chair in Jena, and that was in 2010, we took 20 cases, just simple mitral repairs in 2011, and it took three hours. We had my bypass times of two hours, 20 minutes, and clamp times of an hour. And now, just six years later, look where we are. Again, 20 cases, comparable, sim same amount of stuff. We have reduced operating time by one hour. And this is what uh, Enoch mentioned before. You have to have a team that plays in, and if everything is set up, then all of a sudden you can speed up and, and, and do all this. So uh, with that, you know, with these Bypass and clamp times, we believe that re-expansion, pulmonary edema is not a problem, et cetera, et cetera. So that's it. So now comes repairability. And I'm glad Prakash mentioned the same thing, because that's the same paper that, uh, from David Adams' group that he addressed. He, they took in, at the New York State database 4, 5,400 patients. They all underwent mitral surgery here between 2002 and 13. This here is the repair chance that you have depending on the center or surgeon that you have. So here it is. The larger the volume of the surgeon per cases per year that he does, the greater the chance that the repair, that he will repair, he or she will repair a valve. And this is it. If your, your long-term outcome is going to be much better if your experience per year is more than 25. If it's less than 25, your reoperation rate is going to be higher. So surgical expertise, and this has all been, most of this stuff I'm sure has been done through sternotomy. So what you do at the valve is much more important than how you get there. But the same thing works for minimally invasive. And if you do this, you know, this is, uh, I've trained with Tyrone, and he said always, he said, law, oh, you're minimally invasive stuff. Uh, you're only compromising quality of repair or quality of work at the, at the heart for, minim, for, the, for the size of the incision. You perform poorer for the smaller cut. And um, this is, of course, something that you cannot accept if you go this way. Your quality has to be the same. And this, these guys here have done this. They have done 160 patients, randomized it for complex. So there was Barlow, so bileaflet prolapse uh, issues. And they identified uh, the same result, short and three-year long, three-year result. So, it's, um, it, so it can be done. And just to give you an idea, this is something I'm going to show you. I'm going to show at the German cardiology meeting next month. Um, we have done um, 500 cases where, uh, above in, the, in, the, in that time in Jena, where we had the intention to repair. Um, we had 85% of those we did in, in minimally invasive techniques, so it is something that is reality. It's not cherry picking. And it's, uh, we have uh, a mortality that's not too bad, according to the score at least predicted. And uh, we have a repair rate that's 99%. So four of those, 400, four, four or five, had to be replaced where we had the intention to, re to, re uh, uh, to repair. So it, it, I think repairability, if you have the right experience, it shouldn't be an issue. So you end up with a whole bunch of stuff that you can't really influence, at least much. And... Uh, so, you know, I think that if you then mobilize the patient a little quicker, get them a week earlier into regular work if they're younger, that's an issue, the cosmesis issue is the one anyway. So, and here comes the big question. Prakash already addressed endocarditis. And so, this is the question for you. If there's a 30-year-old mother of a child, and this is a patient that has, that's going to be operated in my department tomorrow, um, a 30-year-old mother of a child and a drug addict. She has um, tricuspid valve endocarditis and needs surgery, and she has active hepatitis C with a high virus load. And so what would you decide? Who would go for stenotomy and who would go for a minimally invasive approach? Is there anybody who would go for a minimally invasive approach here? Okay. So I'll show you how it is in my department. So I got three guys that do minimally invasive mitrals. It's myself, this is my uh, second in command, so to speak, and this is the third in command. And um, so their mixed experience here is uh, illustrated by this bar. And um, if the answer is, he's, he's there tomorrow. So he says, I use the German terms. He says, nine, no. I say, yeah, yes. 
and she is in the middle. That doesn't exist in English, the yes-no mixture, right? <laughs> and, that, and she's not in the middle because she's a woman. It's because uh, it depends on the individual feel. And I would, my feeling and my take on this is, is, is uh, because of the experience uh, that I would feel more comfortable to address that tricuspid valve through a minimally invasive approach than I would through a sternotomy. And um, in his case, it's the other way around. So he is still on the other end of the learning curve still, and that is something that needs to be addressed. So in summary, I'd say that the published results for a minimally invasive and sternotomy mitral valve suggests indeed equipoise. But uh, the differences may not be primarily due to the access, but they may be due to the experience, skill, and training of the person performing it. Um, MIX has the potential to be better and softer endpoints, and of course, MIX is safer than sternotomy, otherwise I 